Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of Pax's new book on civilian harm. Welcome to those of you who are participating with our small in-person audience here in The Hague, but welcome as well to all of you joining us from around the world online via Zoom. We're really pleased that all of, us, all of you are here with us today. So the purpose of the event today is to formally launch this book. It's a really groundbreaking volume that we at Box hope will contribute meaningfully to a broader understanding of the complex and interconnected nature of civilian harm and the negative effects that armed violence has on civilians living in situations of conflict. My name is Carrie Hausbaum. I'm a member of Box's Protection of Civilians team, and I'll be your moderator for both of the panels for today. I unfortunately can't take any credit for any of the immense amount of work that went into producing this book today, but my job is to bring you into conversation with those who did, as well as to introduce um, and to solicit the input of a number of really distinguished experts who will be joining us for the second panel. They'll be speaking about the nature of civilian harm uh, in modern conflicts, sometimes in very personal ways, but also from the perspective of journalists, academics, civil society, and the military. So we have a very full and rich program for you over the next two hours, including hopefully ample opportunities for you to also engage directly with our speakers. So our first panel is going to be an introduction to the book. We'll hear a bit from the authors and editors uh, who will set the stage about the content of the book and uh, hopefully draw out the sort of the most clear lessons uh, and the conclusions that hopefully a variety of different stakeholders will be able to use to better understand, respond to, and ultimately prevent incidents of civilian harm. After a short break, we'll then enter into discussion with a, a number of series of experts who will bring unique and diverse perspectives about the nature of civilian harm in practice, both in the immediate and in the long terms. And I anticipate that they will call upon all of us to frankly do better in the act of protect, protecting civilians in conflict. I'll run quickly through a number of housekeeping notes before we launch into our first panel. Today's event is taking place live, as I said, for a number of in-person guests here in The Hague. Um, for those of us who are joining on Zoom, welcome. We'll also be recording the events um, that may be published then either in part or in its entirety online for people to view later. Please feel free to post about the event or the book uh, on social media. We'd welcome that very much. And we're very eager to invite you to participate directly in our discussion today. We'll be posing a number of poll questions during the break that we can reflect on during our discussion as well. We'll also have, through for those of you joining live via Zoom, uh, the Q&A function active so that you can submit questions to our panelists throughout the event. We'll try as best we can to integrate them into the discussion as we go, but we'll also make sure we reserve enough time at the end for, for discussion and, and addressing those questions. If we're unable to address all the questions that you have and the time we have available, we'll do our best to try to follow up directly or in other communication with all of you participating after the event. If you have any questions <coughs> about the book or about our work on the protection of civilians or civilian harm, please feel free to reach out to our Protection of Civilians team at poc at paxforpeace.nl, and you can always visit our website, protectionofcivilians.org. There, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you can also uh, obtain digital free copies of the book. <coughs> you can download individual chapters, <coughs> read it on the website, or download the book in its entirety. So we welcome you to do so. We're also very pleased today to welcome uh, the director, general director of Box for Peace. Anna Timmerman is here to provide us with some opening remarks. For those who do not know Box well, Box is the largest peace organization here in the Netherlands. And together with local partners living in conflict context <coughs> worldwide, we work together to protect civilians against acts of war, to try to end armed violence, and to build inclusive and lasting peace. So Anna is herself an expert in human rights. She's an author, so she understands the work that goes into a passion project like this. And we're very pleased that you're joining us today. To you. Thank you very much. Dear participants, welcome very much today at the launch of our book, on civilian harm. And it's with great pleasure um, yeah, that I can present this book to you um, that really shows an incredible amount of work of many months or even years of the people at Pax and the communities that we work with. And I think, of course, the reason why we do our job, why we do what we do, is because we care about people. And I think if we talk about violent conflict and civilian harm, it's 
too often or too easy that we talk about numbers. Civilians who are harmed become a number of dead people. We focus on that short moment of a blast or a bomb or an event. Um, and we often don't have enough time to really show what civilian harm means. And that's what really hit me in this book. It shows what, res what harm for civilians can be over a long, long term. And the book shows many examples of how incidents continue um, to have effects over many, many years. It gives the story of survivors of sexual violence, of people who are displaced over many, many decades, people who lose their livelihoods. It's about what happens to communities if, if your uh, essential infrastructure is hit by explosive weapons, for instance, of what it means if you can't work on the land that provides you with food. And it is about the impact of both mental and physical harm <laughs> and the kind of um, the, 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 what you need to really uh, make amends and rebuild those societies. So I think it's a very important book because it brings back that humanity. Uh, and it, it really shows these stories, and I think that that's also our goal, to amplify the voices of the victims, bring them back at the tables where decisions are being made, decisions about military interventions, about peace, um, and really hopefully contribute to those discussions of how we can prevent harm and how we can mitigate harm and what to do after uh, the conflict is over and really realize that it isn't over when it's over. Because in a essence, that's what this book is about. It's really to acknowledge what civilian harm really means. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna, for these opening remarks. We're so glad that you're here. I'd like to now ask our team here to go ahead and play a short video about the book uh, that we'll use as sort of a segue into our first panel with the editors. Deadly airstrike on fish market in Yemen's Hodeida. At least 30 deaths confirmed. The ministry's policy is to limit civilian harm in any circumstance. In your daily paper, in military reports or political statements, when we hear about conflict, we usually hear only a small part of the story. So when we hear a figure like 30 civilian casualties, it actually tells us very little about how civilians living through conflict end up being harmed. It leaves out complex effects like loss of livelihood, psychological trauma, damage to the environment, uh, damage to infrastructure. So what we need to do is we need to start talking about civilian harms in terms of a complex web of problematic consequences that grows over time. Understanding it this way, instead of as civilian casualties, matters for political and military decision-making, for legal purposes, as well as for enabling an effective response to humanitarian crises. Yemen, one month later. The dust has settled and the media are gone. The real consequences for civilians are getting more visible. The fact that a fish market was hit caused a web of interconnected effects. It reduced food availability. People are starving and a growing number of civilians flee the city to find food elsewhere. So when a market is being targeted, what you're doing is you're cutting the food supply, which is already very short, and that's especially because of the siege-like tactics already in place. So you have a large um, hunger issue where children are now malnourished, um, and there's a lot of spread of preventable diseases, and this is all purely man-made. When you only look at the casualties, then you forget the people who are still there on the ground the witnesses, the family members, who are still uh, you know, mourning the loss of their loved ones. And unfortunately, they really need psychological support, but it's very short in supply. The domino effect of underlying problems is set in motion. For communities to recover, we need to get a much better understanding of civilian harm. In the book On Civilian Harm, we explore the full scope of civilian harm. First of all, the victims, like how did they end up in harm's way? Why were they there? Why those civilians? But we also look at the perpetrators. What was their intention? How did they end up harming civilians? What were the methods that they used and the, and the choices that they made? 
The main contribution of this book is that it shows the full extent of civilian harm and that it better shows this complex interrelation between causes and consequences and how that plays out over time. This is a contribution for further debate on how we can better prevent civilian harm and protect civilians in the future. More about on civilian harm, check out the website. I'm joined today by Wilbert van der Zijde and Aaron Beil, both of whom are members of Pax's Protection of Civilians team. And more specifically, they contribute to an initiative that we call Protection in Practice, the ambition of which is to contribute to more civilian, civilian-centered protection policies and practice. Um, and it's mainly conducted through providing training, technical assistance, and apparently by writing very interesting comprehensive books on the subject. We're also joined by another contributor, Velmut Vels, who's a PhD candidate, a researcher, and a consultant with an extensive amount of experience in protection of civilians uh, in UN peacekeeping missions in the field, most notably in Mali, South Sudan, and in the DRC. So thank you very much. Congratulations, first of all, to the three of you on producing this, this book. So Vilbert, as a colleague, I've watched you over the last few years <laughs> work quite hard on this book. If I remember correctly, it began with the ambition of maybe writing a couple of blog articles around the theme of civilian harm. So what made you decide to transition from that original ambition to producing, researching, uh, writing such a, such a detailed book on this topic? And why do you think it's so necessary at this time? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's good to go back to that original thought. So the original thought of the series of blogs was just to show how much we can these days know about what happens to civilians in conflict. And in that sense also challenge to a certain extent the more traditional thinking that you know, once war starts, nobody really knows what's happening inside the black box of war. And only when the fighting subsides and then after that, you know, we'll, we'll send them some uh, research journal journalists or, or maybe some others. And they will sort of figure out like, okay, so how many people died uh, more or less? We want to challenge that, uh, especially because we feel that with, the, uh, with technological advances, uh, there's just so much more to tell about the everyday re reality that civilians face in wartime. So together with uh, our uh, local partners in the countries where, where we work, specifically in Iraq and South Sudan, but also other countries as PAX, uh, but also with organizations that we work with a lot, including Air Wars, Bellingcat, and others, we want to show that uh, we can know more, basically. But once we started doing that, uh, you know, an, immediate, an immediately important question came up too. It's like, so if you can know, what is it that you want to know? It's like, what are the things that you want to look for if you want to investigate civilian harm? Uh, and that sort of led in itself to a second purpose, to, to show what is civilian harm uh, in and of itself. And, but also sort of where do you draw the lines? Like mm. what is included? Is it only the dead and the, and the injured as, uh, as Anna already also uh, uh, talked about? Or, or is it much more than that? And we found of course that it's much more than that. Mm. And finally, if I may still, it's like there's a, there, sort of along the way, a third reason came up. And that's because we, we found out that there's really not one sort of universal lexicon that we use uh, to describe what happens to civilians in conflict, but also to talk about these sort of more abstract concept of mm. civilian harm, protection of civilians. Different actors uh, with different backgrounds have different interpretations of what these terms mean. Mm. Uh, and I'm not saying, uh, I'm not going to claim that this book sort of settles the score and uh, tells us exactly how you should talk about it. But we do hope that this book uh, contributes to building that, that sort of collective lexicon or this mm. collective language on how we can better uh, talk about these issues. Mm. So then how did you approach the task of breaking down such a complex topic and, uh, and yeah, writing it up so clearly for, for a variety of different stakeholders and audiences. Yeah, I think if, if you go into the book, you can see how this is translated into the structure of the book. Mm -hmm. So there's basically two main sections to the book. One section uh, is actually this original uh, collection of blocks in a sense, right? So we have 13 cases of very specific civilian harm events that we look at. Look at. Um, and for all of these cases, what we do is that we ask the same questions for each of the cases. So we talk about what happened, uh, what, what, what happened in terms of like from minute to minute, right? As, as much as we know. But we also ask for each of the cases the question, so who were exactly those civilians being harmed? Who ended up being harmed? Um, 
And then we, for each of the cases, we look at who did actually harm or who caused harm. And we look in all of these cases at the question, to what extent is this, um, uh, how, how often does this occur, this type of harm or this, this sort of event? Uh, is, this, is this like a one-off or is this actually uh, exemplary of, of a much more common uh, way uh, civilians are ending up hurt in conflict? So that's section one. And then section two, we roughly do the same, but then on a slightly more abstracted level. So we, we have a chapter that specifically then looks at what can we say about the civilians being harmed? What can we say about the victims? We have a chapter on uh, the perpetrators, really going deeper into what can, what can we actually say about the intentions, but also the identities of perpetrators? Were they actually out to get the civilians? Uh, or were they um, inadvertently hurting civilians uh, without actually wanting it? And why does that actually matter? Those yeah. kinds of questions come up in that chapter. And then the third chapter, uh, I think by far the most complicated to write, we now call the factors contributing to causing or mitigating civilian harm. Even the title is complicated. And this is where we really talk about, so what are, the, what are those factors? We, we talk about international law, we talk about the norms that there are against use, uh, using violence against <coughs> civilians. Uh, but we also talk, for example, about um, how current trends in modern warfare are, are affecting how civilians are being harmed. So for example, on uh, urban warfare, for example, is one of the things that we discuss in this chapter. So that's the rough structure of this book. Of course, it is a full book, there's a, so there's also a, a fantastic con uh, conclusion mm. uh, and an introduction. Uh, I'm very, we are very grateful for uh, Mariette Schuurman from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who uh, wrote a foreword. Uh, so that's, uh, well, not really a nutshell, but that is the structure of the book. Great. And you found it very necessary to define, come up with your own working definition of civilian harm in the process of writing the book. Erin, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Gary. I think what we found is through those 13 cases of civilian harm is that there is this huge gap between how civilians living in conflict zones all around the world actually experience conflict and also its aftermath, uh, and how we then talk about it when we look at popular media or policymakers and uh, militaries. Um, so we thought we needed to address that. And I think one very useful example, particularly in the Dutch context, um, is actually Havija. So for the international audience who might not know what happened, is that uh, the Dutch military, as part of the coalition against ISIS, in June 2015, bombed the city of Havija, or at least an ammunition factory. And in secondary explosions that followed, um, the news became evident a few years later on that 70 civilians, or a minimum of 70 civilians were killed. And I think that already sort of highlights uh, the problem for us right there, because all the debates in Dutch Parliament were about 70 civilian casualties or more. Um, most articles were about 70 civilian casualties. Conversations we've had with the military were usually also confined to that number of 70 civilian casualties. Um, now, Pax, since a few months, has been doing its own preliminary research together with uh, the University of Utrecht and Al Ghat in Havija on the ground, uh, actually looking at what else can we say? Like, what other effects have civilians then experienced from that particular bombing? Um, and we see that there is a lot of damage to infrastructure, that people have lost access to uh, basic needs and services, that people have lost uh, access to income. Uh, or we see uh, very much situations of protracted displacement, people who actually don't live in Havija anymore, uh, but have been forced to move to other places. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, there's no need to go into the political context of Havija. Havija is just one example of what unfortunately are way too many examples that we have all around the world. Um, so we recognize that need also throughout the cases in the book and we thought we needed to address this. So instead of just talking about civilian casualties, we were, if we want to change this, then we need to come up with our own definition of what civilian harm is. Um, and I think the audience can see it on, on their screens. What we found very important was that it reflects both that civilian harm isn't always um, an individual experience, but it can also be a community experience. For instance, if we're talking about destruction of cultural heritage, uh, it also doesn't need to be physical. Um, often we see that psychological trauma is one of the most enduring effects of violent conflict and also one of the hardest to deal with for people on the ground. Um, and so there were many more effects that we need to take into account and that has eventually led to this new working definition. Thanks, Aaron. So Velmut, in the book, you all describe the need for a variety of different actors to undertake and apply this broader definition of civilian harm when undertaking efforts in, in situations of conflict. Can you elaborate why it's so important 
for the, these different stakeholders to conceptualize of civilian hard more broadly than typically is done in the media and elsewhere. Yes, uh, thank you. It is indeed, <coughs> apologies, um, of, of, of key importance to, to, for actors in, in contexts of conflict to understand civilian harm much broader. First of all, uh, referring back to what Wilworth explained, if now we have the capacity to know as an international community, this also gives us a moral obligation to act upon that knowledge. Um, in addition, um, we have legal obligations under international law to mitigate and prevent harm to civilians uh, in, in times of conflict. But in order to fulfill those obligations, you need to know what the problems are. And just focusing on a number of casualties and injuries at one moment in time does not meet those requirements. Um, then also, particularly for actors, as in, uh, in a conflict, in a violent conflict, militaries and, and military-like actors, they have to realize that um, the civilian space that conflict is, is increasingly the location, is, the, is taking place in, um, is a very important aspect of, of warfare uh, in the current day and age. For example, uh, I think we all remember the images of the city of Aleppo uh, and its destruction of the civilian habitats there. Um, so this, the, I think militaries need to acknowledge, through using this broader definition, they can acknowledge uh, the, the human environment that warfare takes place in much more and in much more detail. And that means um, that in order to be, uh, for them to be effective in their operations, they need to identify civilian harm, track civilian harm, and follow up on civilian harm with mitigation uh, measures. And I think that's the only way that they can adapt operations uh, for, for the prevention of civilian harm. Mm -hmm. So, right. I think this is really useful in terms of providing a bit of a sort of conceptual framework for the book. We've talked a bit about some of the definitions around civilian harm as a concept, but I'm wondering if you can also share with us a few examples from the book of the real life consequences for civilians so that we can get a little bit more of a concrete picture of what we mean by this broader definition in practice. Yes, one thing, one, one term we use in the book is, uh, is reverberating effects, which uh, takes uh, civilian harm beyond the deaths and the injuries. Uh, and actually, it, it takes you in many unexpected directions. And one case that I particularly found very eye-opening was the situation in, in Gaza, um, <clears throat> which took place in a very complex and difficult political context, which already added a, a sort of aspect of vulnerability to the whole community, if you will. And in this context, water and power structure was systematically targeted. Um, and this caused, of course, a shortage of access to drinking water and to uh, electricity for the communities. Um, but it, it doesn't stop there. The reverberating effects, for example, include that household expenses for, for you know, the average man uh, rose to the ceiling because not only because of scarcity of water, they had to buy water, but they needed to buy fuel because there was no electricity to boil the water to make it safe to drink because of the power issues, the purification plants were also not working. So it's an accumulation of problems, or like Aaron explained very aptly in the video, it's a web of interconnected problems that reverberate over time that in the case of Gaza also led to child development issues like stunted growth, uh, an increase of waterborne diseases, but also affects much further away because the uh, wastewater uh, 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 failure, for the failure of the purification plants led to the pumping of raw sewage into the Mediterranean, which was in a, a further away from the area of operations where the conflict actually took place, but it caused environmental damage there, which affected fishing, which in turn affects livelihoods, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So for me, Gaza was a very uh, a telling case, a very good example. Uh, and it's, it's similar effects are, are in, for example, in Yemen, as was highlighted uh, in the video, and in many other places, as you can read in the book. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And I think in, in relation to these examples we've already heard from Gaza or Hawija and, and every question, I think, or every case in the book, we see how difficult it is to address the issue of responsibility. It's a matter that you discuss in great deal, detail in the book. And you purposely do not limit the discussion of responsibility 
to those uh, who deliberately use violence <clears throat> against civilians. So maybe Erin, can you explain why you use the term perpetrators in the book the way that you do? Yeah, so in the term perpetrator, I think it's good first of all to acknowledge that a lot of NGOs or different organizations and institutions also choose for the term belligerent. And we made a very conscious decision not to do that. Um, perpetrator sometimes has a very negative connotation. Uh, and I think for us, because we try to write a book that's relatively neutral and relatively sort of distant from its topic to really take that sort of overall view. Um, we actually want a more neutral version of perpetrator where it really just signifies that those are the people or the institutions, the actors, whatever, um, that contributed to causing harm. Um, and I think actually the M case is a very good example of that because when we look in greater detail at the case, we see that the Saudi-led coalition is responsible for much of the direct violence taking place. Um, so a lot of bombings on cities uh, in Yemen, uh, also an import blockade on many essential foodstuffs reaching cities and Yemeni civilians. Um, but if you look a little bit more closely at that case, which we try to do for every case throughout the book, then we also see that the Saudi-led coalition was to a large extent enabled by other actors. Um, and then we look at states and militaries, for instance, from the U United States, United Kingdom, also France, and uh, multiple other countries where we see that they have either provided arms and ammunition to the Saudi-led coalition, in some cases even intelligence and training of security forces. Um, and we thought it very, to, very important to also use the term perpetrator for those kind of actors, because they usually stay a little bit out of view. But what we actually mean to say with the book is that they contribute to causing harm to civilians as well. Because if you take away that support, you also take away a lot of the firepower, so to speak, of a coalition uh, like that of the Saudis. Um, so we apply that term relatively broadly. Uh, and I think a, a different case in which we make that conscious decision is in South Sudan. Um, which is a case where over uh, about a period of a month, in I think it was July 2016, we see the sharp increase of sexual and gender-based violence taking place against uh, displaced women and girls. Um, in this particular case, what we see is that these displaced women and girls were targeted just outside of UN-protected protection of civilian sites, uh, which in itself is already a very painful fact, I think. Um, again, if you look a little bit more closely, what you see when reading witness accounts, but also um, objective research reports by different institutions, that in various of these cases, we actually know that women and girls were assaulted just a few meters away from these compounds, uh, sometimes in sight and hearing of the UN peacekeepers. Um, the painful thing here being that these peacekeepers have a mandate to protect civilians. Yet they failed to do so in this particular instance. Uh, now, a lot of it's been said and discussed about this topic, so I don't think there's a need for me to add. Um, but the question that we do raise in this book, are you also a perpetrator, or at least responsible for civilian harm, in cases where you fail to take action when you could have done so and you could have contributed to protecting civilians? Um, so that's why, for us, it was very important to, deploy, to apply these relatively broad and neutral definitions of perpetrator as well as victim. Um, to also raise these kind of issues that are often uh, not really addressed. Hmm. Thank you for that. And Wilbert, a big question to you, but a bit of a softball. Uh, for whom is this book intended? Who is the audience for this book? Well, we just finished the book, so I'm not going to say everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all fairness, I think everybody who has a professional interest in understanding civilian harm should read this book. Um, and that very much goes from military. I mean, it's, it's all over the answers that you're getting to your questions already, right? It's, the, uh, it's that mir military have a lot to win and to gain by, uh, by better understanding civilian harm in all its complexity. So, and, and to me, that really, and that's a point I think we, we sometimes need to make. This, this goes beyond military involved in, in CIMIC or CMI, so in, in civilian military uh, relations. This also goes for military planners, operational planners, uh, people working in intelligence. But beyond that, uh, uh, on the civilian side, I would say uh, people working in, in humanitarian organizations uh, that, of course, also very much on the front line deal with, uh, with the consequences of, uh, of civilian harm in the field, but also policy makers of, uh, of ministries of foreign affairs and other ministries, development ministries. 
Uh, there, there's, I can go on and on. I th I, uh, two others I would like to mention. I think academics. I think there's still, you know, uh, as much as we're proud of this book, I think there's still a lot to be said. And mm -hmm. so this book is not the end of the story, and it, uh, uh, but it can function maybe as a, as a starting point for more research and, and more uh, analysis. Uh, and finally, and it's, I'm not only saying this because Velmoed is here, but I think also lawyers and especially <laughs> people uh, specializing in international law, mm -hmm. um, there's still international law has its limitations and, and that also means that it has its limitation on how we can approach this topic and that's, that's a topic that I think uh, warrants more uh, attention in the future. Mm. Thanks. So definitely visit our website uh, and download your own copy. So as a Dutch peace organization, certainly one of our most important stakeholders here is the Dutch government, certainly the Dutch military as well. We were very honored this week to be able to formally present the very first copy of the book to Anke Beileveld, the Dutch Minister of Defense. And I'd like to now show a short video clip of that official handover moment. Minister Beileveld. Ik ben zeer verheugd dat ik juist aan u het eerste exemplaar van ons boek Onze Vil in Harm mag aanbieden. Uh, juist aan u omdat ik denk dat het gaat over een onderwerp wat ons allebei heel erg aan het hart gaat. En dat is het leed dat burgers treft in uh, gewapende conflicten. En het is ook een onderwerp waar we samen met de mensen van Defensie en Pax ook al lang aan werken en uh, altijd goed over in gesprek zijn. Hoe kan je nou die risico's verkleinen en wat kan je doen na conflicten om mensen te helpen. En Pax heeft dit boek gemaakt omdat we verder willen kijken dan aantallen slachtoffers, aantal gewonden, aantallen mensen die uh, moeten vluchten. En dit boek gaat eigenlijk in op de lange termijn effecten van gewapende conflicten, speciaal voor burgers. Wat gebeurt er als uh, de watervoorziening niet meer werkt, als het milieu um, verstoord is, als er oliebedrijven uh, in de fik gaan, als je ziekenhuizen worden gebombardeerd. En wat, hoe gaan we om met die lange termijn effecten en hoe kunnen we daar ook bij de planning rekening mee houden en achteraf zorgen dat we de impact zoveel mogelijk mitigeren. Ik weet dat dat onderwerpen zijn die voor u ook heel belangrijk ja. zijn. Dus ik ben ontzettend blij dat u meteen ja zei toen we het vroegen. Ja. En nu mag ik het boek aan u overhandigen. Alsjeblieft. Dank je wel. Um, ik stel het ook echt zeer op prijs om het eerste exemplaar in ontvangst uh, te nemen. Omdat het inderdaad een onderwerp is wat mij en ons hier bij Defensie aan het, uh, aan het hart uh, gaat. En zeker ook de lange termijn effecten. Ja, want oorlogs, bij oorlogsvoering kan je niet alle risico's uh, voorkomen. We hebben daar met elkaar vaak over uh, gesproken in de afgelopen uh, jaren. En we doen er alles aan hè, om zowel burgerslachtoffers als verwoesting uh, in sommige gebieden om die te vermijden en te kijken naar de effecten. Maar je kan niet alles uh, voorkomen. En dan is het belangrijk juist ook zo'n boek te hebben wat naar de toekomst uh, kijkt om te kijken van wat, wat kan je daar, wat kan je leren. Zelf heb ik in de afgelopen tijd ook veel geleerd van de gesprekken gesprekken met, uh, met Pax, en die ook Pax met onze mensen heeft uh, gehad bij Defensie. Omdat dat ik denk dat het eerste is dat we open moeten zijn over wat er uh, gebeurt. En dat we open moeten aangeven wat risico's soms uh, uh, zijn. Dat het altijd om mensen gaat uh, die ergens wonen in de wereld. Uh, waar soms hun voorzieningen weggaan of waar soms hun familie uiteindelijk niet meer uh, leeft. We hebben veel met elkaar bijvoorbeeld gesproken over, als je kijkt naar Hawitja, hadden we daar anders mee om kunnen gaan. Wat ik er zelf van geleerd heb, is als je kijkt naar voorzieningen, dat daar voor ons nu een hele goede oplossing is gevonden met een aantal NGO-organisaties. Om juist te kijken in Hawitja, kunnen we wat betekenen voor de, voor de gemeenschap. Ik heb zelf bijvoorbeeld, ik ben nog niet zo lang geleden in Suriname geweest, een heel ander voorbeeld, heb ik ook gezien hoe belangrijk het is, hè? Ook al dat er, dat er uiteindelijk voorzieningen zijn, dat is in, in Hawitja ook het uh, uh, geval. In het hele Midden-Oosten is dat natuurlijk een belangrijk uh, uh, thema. Dus bedankt voor het boek. Ook uh, goed dat we er uiteindelijk met elkaar over spreken. En ik hoop van harte dat we er ook gewoon over blijven praten. Uh, in ieder geval zullen wij uh, uh, open zijn over, uh, over de effecten. Omdat dat het begin is van het gesprek naar de toekomst, zou ik willen zeggen. En bedankt voor het eerste exemplaar. Ik ga het ook echt met liefde lezen. Right. 
Now you've officially handed over the first copy of the book, indeed, to the Minister of Defense here in the Netherlands, but there's certainly a broader audience out there waiting to read this book. So I'd just like to ask each of you to maybe share what is, for you, the main thing that you hope people will take away from this book. Maybe Velmut, starting with you. Yes, thank you. Well, I very much hope that people, particularly militaries and other actors who are engaged in violent conflict, will start to see the need uh, for understanding the human environment they operate in and to, to, to the need for, for, um, for, for tracking and charting the different effects that uh, armed violence has on the civilians living in their area. Not just the short term and immediate effect, but also the long term and that they start to see the need to understand this complex web uh, of effects of their actions. Thanks so much. Erin, also from you. Um, yeah, I think my point actually ties in very well with what Wilmot has said and what I've already said before and Wilbert has said. Um, but I, I really think and I really hope that we start talking about civilian harm in a slightly different way. So in a way where we acknowledge that it is much more than uh, people dying and getting injured, which of course is, is horrible in itself, but we also need to look beyond that. Um, and a particular point I want to stress is also particularly the longevity of civilian harm or potential longevity of civilian harm. Uh, we've chosen cases that often are relatively recent in nature, so dating back to 2014, 2016. And for all these cases, we see that even when we're researching them four or five years later, or e even several years after that, um, the effects of those conflicts or those particular instances of violence are still affecting people to this day. Um, even though these stories have disappeared from the news or disappeared from public debate. So I really hope that's uh, something people will take away. And certainly there are case studies that also look much further back in time, looking at the explosive yeah. remnants of war yeah. in places like Cambodia over the course of even 50, 60 years as well. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Vilbert, other key takeaways? I think for me it's, it's going back to that point that, that I started with uh, this, this I hope we drive home the point that we can know what happens to civilians uh, in conflict, that with open source intelligence, with all the social media, with working with, uh, in close cooperation with local uh, people affected by conflict on the ground, we can know. And if we can know, we also must know to a certain extent. Um, <coughs> we have this obligation that, uh, that Velmoed already talked about. If we want to truly be better at protecting civilians and at, at mitigating civilian harm, uh, we must know better than, uh, we, we must know more and uh, do the effort to know more uh, to be able to achieve that. And I hope this book drives that point home. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I'd like to spend just a few more minutes before we sort of close the session by hearing uh, a little bit more from each of you about potentially a particular statement, a, a victim's narrative, a story that came to the fore while you were researching this book that you found particularly impactful for yourself uh, as, as a practitioner in this field. Maybe I'll start this time with Vilberts. <coughs> yeah, for me, I, it's not so much a, a statement, but I, I was really caught by the case in the book. I think it's case two uh, on the oil fires in uh, Kajara in um, Iraq. Um, it's also a very um, uh, visually uh, famous case because there's so many great photos of the black sheep and whatever. So what happened is that IS set fire to the oil wells, but also the oil pipelines, basically out of spite. I mean, they were on the retreat and they just wanted to punish uh, the local population, but they also wanted to um, uh, slow down the, the advance of the, of the coming forces of the coalition. Um, and it's not so much one quote, but it's, it's this sort of whole image of, of local teachers um, mm -hmm. being brave and um, it's actually uh, making me emotional. It's like the, it's this picture of, of them trying to still uh, keep schools open, mm -hmm. but also the parents of these children explaining that, that they, you know, some people had said like, why, why don't you just go away? But it's, it's never that simple. Mm. Going away means that you lose your house, but that you go to an equally unsafe place. So these people are living uh, in sooth and smoke, which is clearly bad for their health and still trying to do the best they can do for, uh, for, local, for the local children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for that story. Erin, do you have one as well that sticks with you? Yeah, I, I think, to be honest, that from all the cases I researched, um, all of them stuck with me uh, because you, while researching, you're actually reading through witness uh, statements about what happened. 
Uh, and I also, I, I know that for all these cases, we deliberately took that effort to not only as outsiders be speaking about the harm that they endure, but to also really make sure that we hear it in their own voices uh, from their own experience. Um, I think the most difficult case for me to work on was actually the one on South Sudan that I referenced before about the sexual and gender-based violence. Um, first of all, because we're, you're reading statements and then you always see in brackets uh, the age of the victim. And there were a lot of 15, 16 year old girls in there, uh, which is just really painful in itself. Um, and the second thing about that case, which I thought was really painful, is that in many of the cases we see that the harm that actually happens to people doesn't really get acknowledged or doesn't really get addressed. Uh, but for sexual violence, it's not just the fact that there is no acknowledgement. We often see that these women uh, who have been raped are then um, forced to leave their own communities, are actually blamed for the rape happening to them. Um, and I think, to a lesser extent, I think that's what women around the world always recognize. So I think it also hit closer to home because of that. Um, but it's just very, uh, it's very difficult, uh, heartbreaking, to be honest, to read about these statements where women are, I, I wish they would have killed me, instead of having to endure sort of, first of all, the rape, the humiliation, but then also being kicked out by my own community and having nowhere to go. So that was, uh, yeah, a difficult one. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Erin. Belmuts. Yeah, the same for me. It's the, the, the personal stories that, that, that came up as we were researching this book and reading witness testimonies. Um, and it shows you how it's about actual people. It's not a theory. It's not a legal issue. It's not a military strategic issue. It's really an issue about people and how they lead their daily lives. Um, and, and one of the things that struck me was the desperate measures that people refer to when their world is crumbling down around them. Uh, for example, getting back to the water issue, this was also the case in Syria during the civil war where water plants were systematically uh, bombed and attacked. And um, in the case, we describe uh, how uh, people in a desperate attempt to get the water flowing again try to install a generator, but then they have to wait for shooting to subside to pass through with the generator. And then the truck gets stuck because the road has been destroyed. And then as they are there trying to install the generator uh, with the help of WhatsApp and YouTube films because they can't you know, communicate easily and get more technicians over half the actual specialty, mm -hmm. they are still being shot at. Um, and then, um, but on a, an, on a more sort of personal, like daily life issue, in the same case, there is a woman who describes how she cut her hair and that of her daughters because they could not afford the water to wash their hair. So, you know, that's, yeah, those little person, imagine that you have to do that that you, can't ha you don't have water to wash your hair, and how they kept fish in the water tank because the water was so unclean and they couldn't boil it and they didn't have any measure to really properly purify it. They kept fish in the drinking water to, to check if the fish died, then there was definitely something wrong with the water. If the fish didn't die, then maybe it was safe to drink. So that level of desperate measures, which you see also in many other cases, um, yeah, I found that really, really striking. Hmm. and deeply sad. So thank you so much. I think that helps actually really ground a lot of the theory that we've already addressed in this sort of introductory panel and put it a little bit in perspective um, that really the purpose of this book is not necessarily to just add to the discourse for policymakers, members of the military and the media, but really to bring to the fore stories from people, real people affected by conflict um, and bring those into the discussion as well. So thank you so much to Velmut, to Erin, and to Vilbert um, for joining us today. And certainly, I think, for turning what would have been a blog into what <laughs> I, in my entirely biased opinion, find a remarkably readable 300-page anthology on this subject. So we'll take now a short break before we transition to our second panel. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, we'll be restarting the formal program at 4 PM here local time. So please do stretch your legs, grab another cup of coffee. Um, in the meantime, though, we will be posing a number of poll questions to all of the, you joining us in the audience uh, virtually. So we really hope that you'll take the opportunity to contribute your own perspectives to this discussion as well. In the meantime as well, please feel free to continue uh, adding questions to the Q&A um, that we'll uh, go into more detail with uh, exploring at the end of the event. You can again take the time to head to protectionofcivilians.org to download your copy of the book. 
Um, and I'll look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you all back here in just a few minutes' time so we can continue with our second panel, in which we'll dive more deeply into the realities, again, of civilian harm and its implications for civilians, for security forces, and really for all of us. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Thanks to those of you who responded to the poll questions that we posed during the break. We hope to be able to reference these as we continue our discussion. And please do continue submitting questions uh, using the Q&A function in Zoom to our distinguished panelists. We're now joined by a really unique and diverse set of perspectives here uh, on the panel, some of whom are joining us here live in The Hague, and others will be calling in from further afield. What we really want to do for the next hour is spend some more time discussing in detail the complex and reverberating effects of armed violence for civilians living in conflict and talk about what needs to happen in order to address some of the fundamental issues related to responsibility, accountability, and appropriate responses when incidents of civilian harm do occur. So we're aiming again for a bit more of a conversation rather than more formal presentations. And we hope uh, that we'll indeed hand things over to our audience before too long for the Q&A. So we'll breeze through, unfortunately, maybe a, a series of different topics um, that probably is not going to do justice to the wealth of expertise that we have here with our panelists. So I'm going to have to ask everybody to keep the responses relatively short. Um, but again, we'll do our best to follow up after the event in case there is just more conversation than fits into the next hour. So what I'd like to do is start off by asking a couple of you to reflect on this idea of the broader definition of civilian harm that's being presented in this book. So typically, again, we talk about the idea of civilian harm in terms of the, the injured and the dead, the countable immediate direct casualties. But again, this book proposes a much broader concept that's a bit more all-encompassing. Um, so first, maybe to Alma, Alma Mustafich. Uh, you're currently a lecturer at the University of Utrecht, uh, uh, University of Applied Sciences at Utrecht University. However, as a teenager, you lived through the siege of Srebrenica. You survived and you came to the Netherlands, but as, as I understand, you lost quite a number of family members during the genocide. And your father uh, had worked for the Dutch Army Battalion. So why do you think that this broadened definition of civilian harm is necessary at this time? Well, let me start with Srebrenica genocide. When we talk about Srebrenica, it's always about uh, 8,000 um, killed boys and men, and that's it. I mean, those are just numbers. They say nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, what does Srebrenica mean to me? Um, I never counted how many family members and friends I have lost until uh, last year. And then I start counting, and I get up to uh, 56. And we just stopped, you know, because every name brings so much memories and so much pain. Um, so what does it mean to us? To us, it's beside losing the loved ones, um, families are being torn apart. Um, we are displaced all over the world, you know, in US, uh, Australia as well. Um, People have been killed, of course, but uh, sexual violence, uh, just like we uh, have heard previous speakers about, uh, that was terrible, you know, that turns community as well. Um, dreams, future, everything is gone, you know, and it feels just like there is a hole inside of me and no matter what, what I try to do, it's just not going to heal. Um, and I think every single person who lived something uh, that I did would agree with me that we are more dead than alive. That's how it feels. And uh, not only me, you know, my daughter, for example, as well, and I think children of my children as well. And I think it's it's so important to um, recognize those, how can I call them, maybe soft sides of definition of civilian harm. Mm. 
Thank you so much, Alma, for being here today and for being willing to speak so candidly about your experience. Um, I have goosebumps already, so thank you for being here. Thank you. Youssef Rahman, um, you are a senior political advisor at Amnesty International, and you've long worked on topics related to civilian harm, human rights, international security, with a particular attention to Dutch engagement yeah. within military missions for the UN and NATO, for instance. And you're also an expert in the types of psychological harm that Alma was just mentioning, um, and the effects of conflict on refugees and other vulnerable communities over time. Would you argue that this broadened definition of civilian harm is therefore useful, also in particular when, when you're engaging with armed actors or with politicians and diplomats? Yes, I think it's, um, it, it, it's, it's very useful. And I also want to commend Pax on a very uh, uh, excellent book. It's, it's not only uh, uh, in depth and um, uh, it goes into detail over a lot of um, uh, areas that I've worked with um, over the last six years. It also looks um, amazing so to, to flip through. So I would encourage everybody to uh, go to the website or to get it, a hard copy somewhere. I do think that the um, a broader definition of civilian harm as, they pre as is presented in the book um, is useful uh, for military, but also for politicians, because it's not only the military, but it's also the politicians that look at, um, as was mentioned by Aaron, the number of casualties or death, actually, we should say, in be it Srebrenica, be it Hawija, uh, Afghanistan, or other uh, military uh, theaters where, where the D Dutch uh, engaged in. Um, I think it's very good to... Um, uh, to, to present a much more broader perspective on it. And also, um, if I may add a, a, a little, um, uh, just a small portion over a larger period of time, because then you get really, uh, you get to see, uh, re to, to see really what the effects of, um, uh, of military uh, uh, engagement, um, what, they, what, what it come down, comes down to. Oh, thank you so much for that, Youssef. And also for, promoting the book so nicely. We appreciate that. I'd also like to invite uh, my colleague, Mark Garlasco, uh, who's joining us remotely from New York. You worked previously as the chief of high value targeting in the US Department of Defense before making the switch from the military to working with the United Nations and the mission in Afghanistan, as well as with organizations like Human Rights Watch, where you conducted technical investigations of civilian harm in places like Georgia, Gaza, Iraq, Myanmar, and plenty of other locations. Currently, you're also working uh, with those of us at Box as a military advisor. Do you think that the application of this broadened definition by, among others, militaries is realistic in practice? Yeah, it's not just realistic, but I think it's necessary. Uh, and I, I wouldn't call it a broadened definition. I would call it a more realistic definition uh, because we're not looking just at the, the deaths and injuries but you know, the ongoing effects that occur within a, a society. Uh, when you look at the way that militaries view civilian harm, I think it's instructive for us to look at the historical case. You know, it, it was only in 2002 uh, when General Tommy Franks said, we don't do body counts. And this was the idea that the United States military is not going to quantify the number of civilians harmed on the battlefield. And the idea that during the conflict in Afghanistan and then later in Iraq in 2003, that this was a new idea to actually hmm. figure out how many civilians are being killed and injured is, is kind of shocking to us now. And as we've moved forward and worked to bring the military along um, to understand how many civilians are killed and injured by their actions, it's now incumbent upon us to instruct them on the additional effects of their acts and to try to better protect civilians. Because protection of civilians is not just protecting uh, the, the individuals at the time of the, the strikes, at the time of the conflict. I think we need to broaden the idea and explain to them that there are further effects and that they are quantifiable. And that is really the challenge that is brought to us now uh, to relate to the military so that they can improve uh, the work they're doing and in the end, improve civilian protection. Thank you so much for that, Mark. We really appreciate that. 
So in the first panel, uh, we introduced this idea of the so-called reverberating effects of civilian harm. So the types of harm that might only become visible over time and that might be caused more indirectly from the use of force against civilians. So Lauren Gould, you're an assistant professor at the Utrecht University Center for Conflict Studies, but also you lead its Intimacies of Remote Warfare program. Could you maybe also, again, provide us with some more tangible examples um, from your own experience and your own research of what reverberating effects look like in practice? Yeah, um, so as Erin already mentioned in the first half, uh, the Intimacies of Remote Warfare program has teamed up with PAX and al Khat. Um, and also a, a, a lovely, um, very uh, bright uh, body of students to study these reverberating effects in Hawija. Um, and what really struck me from the interviews that we've now conducted there, that over 60, is this kind of compounding effect. So you, again, this was mentioned in the first panel, but how you know life under ISIS was already you know really bad. But when you drop a bomb and people then, you know, need medical assistance, you know, 70 civilians at least killed, four to 500 buildings destroyed, this just compounds this civilian harm effect. And I thought, if I may, I've got it on my phone, so that's why I'm going to reach for my phone now. Um, I'd just like to read a quote from one of the civilians that we interviewed. Um, saying all my friends were suffering the same fear of sleep, nightmares, sleep deprivation, loneliness, and hypersensitivity to loud sounds. We are afraid that the plane would come and bomb us or we would be killed by ice. Our fate was unknown. Imagine you were living under the control of oppressive people who had no mercy or humanity and war planes were also striking innocent people instead of killing IS. So how could we feel safe under these circumstances? Yeah, so this brings depth to the stories, right? Moves us beyond civilian casualties. But I think I'd like to take up um, Vilbert's challenge. So what do we do with this as academics? Um, and I would like to say m my most important takeaway is that civilian harm is politics. Mm -hmm. It's not just a legal mandate. It's not an ethical mandate. It's politics. These, this kind of civilian harm is not only felt, endured, lived through for the rest of your life, it's given meaning by people. So in this research that we're conducting, we also ask who do they blame? Who do they hold accountable? How does it figure in their day-to-day -day lives? What do they, you know, civilians want to see in terms of acknowledgement and and um, and uh, um, re yeah, justice? And I think um, you know, we can only move to that conversation when we really start to understand the depths of civ the civilian harm that takes place. Thank you for that, Lauren. And also, I really appreciate you bringing again a civilian voice a little bit more directly to the table, so thank you for that. So Alma, I'd like to look back to you for a moment to reflect on this idea of the potential longevity of civilian harm. So you're quite vocal in the Netherlands about what it has been like to live through an experience like the siege of Srebrenica and the genocide on the Muslim population. Um, you also contributed to a podcast recently um, on this topic where you made a comment that really struck me. And you said, um, well, I might paraphrase, while other people are always busy with planning their vacation and doing fun things, we always live from the 7th of July to the 7th of July. 11th. 11th, sorry, 11th of July. The events of Srebrenica occurred 25 years ago, but what kind of meaning does that still have for you today? Yes, well, I would like to say something about that, but before that, let me uh, have a word about um, victim's voice on the table, because I heard this uh, uh, in previous uh, um, panel. Um, it's so important uh, to have those voices on the table, um, because we are capable of talking ourselves. So I'm really surprised that I'm the only one survivor sitting here with all those experts. So having said that, <laughs> I'm going, <laughs> you, you know, it's time to see us as experts. We are not just victims. We have thoughts. We have questions. We know which researchers' questions are the best. And nobody wants to hear that because there is always somebody upstairs who said to me, well, Alma, nice for you, but I don't think that's the good question. You need to see us not as victims, but as human beings. Having said that, <laughs> Srebrenica, I mean, 
surviving genocide is like a um, life sentence. We go to bed with it, uh, we get up uh, with Srebrenica in our minds. Uh, you cannot leave it behind you and you don't want to leave it behind you. You, know, you just want people to listen to you and to learn something from it so that we can prevent next genocide. I mean, this is 25 years ago in Europe and we don't even know about it. Mm. Um, yeah, for example, um, last year one of my colleagues uh, said to me, Alma, okay, I understand it's 25 years ago, but when is it going to be over? Mm. And I didn't even, found, we didn't even found all of our loved ones who has been killed. So they couldn't find any peace. So how can I f find any peace? And the only thing that I'm asking is just look at this, you know, learn from this and try to stop it. But it's not going to happen as long people are just talking about us and not with us. Mm. So, um, oh yeah, I have another one question, uh, another one uh, example um, about how how we how do we treat uh, victims? <laughs> I was reading a book of uh, Elie Wiesel, The Night, um, and um, I could recognize everything that he was writing down. And at some point, um, I just get really emotional because uh, not because of the events. Uh, but because of the stuff that he uh, lived through afterwards. And at some point he said, I survived Holocaust, and then I actually had to explain to other people that I was genocide survivor. Um, what does it teach us? You know, It's 50 years ago, and I could write the same thing right now. It's about how do we treat victims or survivors of such uh, events. It seems to me like we haven't learned anything from it. Thank you for that. That's actually a perfect segue into, I think, what I'd like to talk about next, which is this idea of the, the discourse mm -hmm. around civilian harm. I think clearly all of those of us at the table would certainly argue that there's more need for an attention to civilian harm generally, but certainly with regards to these reverberating effects of conflict. But in order to encourage policymakers, militaries, the media, the broader public to reckon really with the ugliness of war, the discourse we engage in really matters. Mm -hmm. um, and starting by, I think, rightly put by Alma, putting the voices and the experiences yeah, and of survivors Not only first. here, I mean mm -hmm. Amnesty, Pax, uh, governments, and all of those organizations, UN. Uh, I, 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 I think if one of the Srebrenica survivors would be at the top of the UN, we wouldn't have this situation in China right now. But so that's my point. You need to, to, to include uh, survivors on the highest level, you know, to, to make decisions. Absolutely. No, thank you for that comment. I really appreciate that. Um, Lauren, as well, you, prior to this event, you shared a quote with us mm -hmm. that I'd like for you to reflect on um, that we'll bring on screen for our viewers online as well. So you do a lot of work on remote warfare, Yep. right? Which might involve, for instance, carrying out airstrikes without having boots on the ground, so to speak. Can you briefly explain how the way in which modern modes of warfare are sort of playing out on the ground may hinder the scrutiny that we as a public end up not necessarily learning about the harm that's being conducted uh, or being caused uh, on civilians essentially on our behalf. Absolutely, because there's a lot of steps before even getting to the, to the table yeah. um, that we're missing here. So um, yeah, we study um, the changing nature of warfare and how advanced militaries, but we focus particularly on Western advanced militaries are turning to remote warfare. So they're engaging in military action, but with no boots on the ground and using airstrikes and drone strikes and um, partnering partnershiping with local actors to kind of do the fighting and dying on our behalf. Um, now, what's interesting about this phenomena and one of the intimacies that we study is um, civilian harm, because on the one hand, it's this kind of warfare is very safe for our military men and women, so we have no returning body bags on our side, or very limited. But of course, these military interventions and war is still destructive and, and, and very violent for those on the receiving end mm -hmm. um, and those for the civilians on the receiving end. However, the way that these types of interventions are talked about um, 
would have you believe that they weren't. They're very often framed um, when legitimizing these uh, interventions in terms of surgical or precision airstrikes. This was part of my, my quote. Um, but also saying, you know, uh, zero civilian casualties are our utmost priority. Um, and that would seemingly create this idea that we're killing with care. And then it becomes very hard to care for those that we kill, right? Who, who are being killed in our name. Now, contradicting this with what actually happens when a civilian harm, civilian harm does occur, namely that Western militaries either deny entirely that they've occurred, they keep them secret, um, or in, in some events they'll acknowledge, you know, maybe, you know, the UK is in the anti-IS coalition of bombed 4,000 or engaged in 4,000 military, uh, 4,000 missions, have acknowledged one civilian casualty. And, you know, the coalition in its entirety, you know, 1,400. But in the numbers produced by civilian um, uh, civil society are much higher, around to between 8,000 and 14,000. So there is this difficulty of even getting the acknowledgement of the numbers, let alone the civilians at, at the table. And I think this is really um, um, detrimental to, to our democracies, not just for those on the receiving end, but we have no democratic control over the wars that are waged in our name because we're not informed about the consequences. So this is indeed, and then we, because we no longer feel the effects through our own body bags, we are not informed about the consequences on, you know, in the day-to-day -day lives of those on the end of our violence. We ha there is so little understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's where I said, you know, war is politics. That, that's only for us. Those on the receiving end know exactly what happened, how many people were killed, how many lives were destroyed. And they give meaning to that. There is a lot of resentment and, and anger. Uh, and we see this in the Hawija case. You know, th those on the receiving end do know the Netherlands was responsible. They do know that the Netherlands denied for four and a half years that these civil civilians occurred. And although now, you know, it is great that the Ministry of Defense, but also politicians, it's not just the Ministry of Defense, are engaging in discussions, but we need to, we need to do better on this mm -hmm. because this just sows the seeds for the next violence, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it feeds into cycles of violence and ultimately creates more insecurity for us mm -hmm. because that's, you know, that's how people get mobilized into, into these insurgencies that we try to defeat in mm -hmm. using these. So, you know, we end up in this cycle of violence that I think for, you know, everybody is mm -hmm. creating a lot of insecurity. Thanks for that. I, it, and maybe to bring you, Sif, back in, you've also worked very closely uh, with sort of Dutch politics for years. You've seen and experienced how governments themselves engage in discourse around civilian harm. So what, have you, what do you notice? What, what, if anything, do you think needs to really change about how um, well, yeah, politicians? It, it's a very good question. And um, I, first, I should say that Amnesty n normally doesn't take position in whether to go to, to war or, 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 or to engage in a conflict or not. But what I see on the, on the governing end and also politicians in, uh, in, the, in parliament is um, um, whenever there is a decision uh, on the table whether to send Dutch troops or not, uh, we are going to start a kind of process calling our Article 100 procedure. So Article 100 of the Dutch um, Constitution sa it says that uh, government should be informed when, um, or the, pol the, the parliament should be informed once going, uh, sending troops to a mission, to a UN or NATO mission. Um, and in that way, they are trying to, um, well, to, to kind of um, uh, Plotsland. Well, they're, they're, they're trying to, to make a clean process on uh, and steps, which steps should be taken. And of course, they are focusing also on the, the, the safety of the Dutch military, which is all very understandable from uh, one side. But um, it, I can imagine that it also um, it doesn't do it doesn't do justice to the whole to the whole picture. Mm -hmm. um, and it also has to do with. Um, with the, the, the media, with the, uh, the, the whole, the, the whole, the whole um, range of topics that politicians need to uh, and, and need to need to tackle. So, if I if we look at the book, for example, there, there's a whole case on the Yazidi. Well, we all recall when the Yazidis were fleeing to the uh, on the mountain, Mount Sinjar, and everybody was more or less confident that there should be um, uh, action and they, they, sh they should be saved. 
which happened, but then afterwards, what, what, what is, we are not talking about the Yazidis anymore. They are not being discussed or value, ver, to a very, uh, in a very limited way, also in Dutch Parliament. And you see the, I get emails from Yazidis that are now in the Netherlands. Where is our story? We, we don't hear uh, uh, anything anymore. And um, that's also why I think it's so, so important to not only take into account the, the immediate effects, but also the longer term effects, because they really feel forgotten right now. Mm. Ah, thank you for that. I'd like to now bring uh, into discussion with us Christian Triebert, who's been waiting very patiently um, on, on Zoom. You are uh, long active as a senior investigator for Bellingcat and contributed to monitoring work by organizations like Air Wars, where you use publicly available digital data to examine international crime and to analyze conflict. And you currently work now as a, a journalist for the New York Times. So you are on the side that's informing and producing essentially public discourse. So why do you think it's so difficult to get this sort of broader understanding of civilian harm out in the open? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one, one part of it is that sometimes these airstrikes are being conducted indeed, um, as Lauren said, right, remotely. And I think sometimes these airstrikes happen, as we saw in the case of the, the air war against the so-called Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, uh, is happening um, in areas that are not accessible to journalists or hardly accessible, right? Um, similarly, we can see that happening in certain areas of uh, Afghanistan um, or Israeli airstrikes in Gaza where international journalists uh, wouldn't immediately have had access. And, you know, I think what I what what was very interesting uh, at the time with Bellingcat and Air Wars, but even now with the New York Times, is that um, militaries, defense departments around the world, uh, whether it's the Russian Minister of Defense, whether it's the Pentagon, whether it's the Israeli military, they all publish videos on Twitter and YouTube showing indeed like these kind of precision strikes or like, oh, this is like a weapon depot, a tunnel system and so on. And I think, you know, this is this this can get a creative feeling of, of, of certain detachment, as was mentioned before. Um, but it's also very interesting for us as journalists, if we cannot access the um, area where airstrikes are happening are being conducted, you know, what is the information we can still use to find out something more? And sometimes it is these propaganda videos that are being put online by defense ministries or um, people on the ground that are filming the, the aftermath of an airstrike or sometimes even the impact. And I think this is something very important to acknowledge, right? Like I think traditionally journalism is seen, we need to be there to cover it. And you know, ideally that would be the case, but in some instances, what we've seen in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, uh, and Gaza is um, we don't have access. So what are still the ways for us to investigate civilian harm? And um, in, in many instances, we, we are dependent, you know, on people that are, that are you know, risking their lives to film um, the moment of an airstrike or the aftermath or, or propaganda videos, whether it may be from an armed group or from a defense ministry. Thank you for that, Christian. Um, and maybe to continue with that point as well, you provided us a quote as well in advance of the event, um, wherein you indicate that we can't necessarily depend upon formal security actors, like even our own militaries, to conduct proper investigations of civilian harm. So what capacity does there exist then within academia, civil society, the media, or elsewhere, to really know the effects of conflict on civilians? And I think at a at a sort of more abstract level, maybe, does, does this idea of the fog of war even exist anymore? Sorry, it was a question for That was for, for you, or? please, yes. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, I kind of like, I figured that uh, the quote uh, was already uh, what I was explaining, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, what I was trying to say with the quote is basically what I said before is that, you know, um, it is sometimes really hard to uh, get an understanding of what is going on. Um, let's take the Netherlands as an example, right, which used to be very, very intransparent about where there would be bombing, you know, they would not even um, show in their statements in which country they were bombing, whether it was Syria or Iraq, it was unclear. So, you know, in that, those instances, what can we still know more? You know, is it weapon remnants that people that are affected filmed or brought or photographed and put online, right? Um, because sometimes there's no other way to contact people as well in the immediate aftermath of an airstrike. 
Um, so it's all these small clues. Can we use satellite imagery and link it up with um, and match it and corroborate it with those uh, videos that are published by defense ministries where they're like allegedly bombing a tunnel network or a, um, um, a, a bomb making factory, you know, it's like they, they, they publish these videos with these claims and they may have well been a legitimate military target, but can we link anything to, okay, who is responsible for this airstrike, but also um, what may have been the civilian harm there? And can we match reports on the ground with, with reports from uh, defense ministries? Thanks, then maybe also to follow up on that to you, Mark. Um, I'm curious for a response to what you just heard from Christian and, and maybe to reflect on whether you think in your experience having worked uh, in the military, why should militaries gather and even publish comprehensive data on civilian harm and maybe why don't they currently do so? And maybe uh, in the meantime we can also pull up the responses we got from the audience to the poll question um, where we asked our audience here to reflect on the statement that militaries should take all feasible steps to investigate civilian harm caused by their actions. Hopefully you can see the answers if they come up as well um, and we can have you reflect on that. Yeah, thanks a lot. And Christian, I, I greatly appreciate your comments, particularly from someone who's been investigating uh, war crimes like myself in the field, but also uh, in Syria, for example, where I did not have access to the country and we had to develop non-permissive um, ways to get the information. And looking at the way that Bellingcat, New York Times, and others have also conducted these investigations is really instructive on how a military can better conduct uh, investigations into civilian harm. And, and to answer your question, Carrie, you know, first of all, militaries have a legal obligation, uh, and, and we need to understand that. They have a legal obligation uh, not to uh, unduly harm civilians, uh, and part of that is a quantification of it, because when you understand how and why civilians are being harmed, then you can improve civilian protection. So it's really part of a cycle, uh, and it's this civilian harm mitigation cycle that we work with with militaries. Having been on the inside, though, I, I think there's really an issue. There are a couple of things. One is quantification. You know, uh, I remember during the war in er Iraq in 2003, when I was doing targeting and making target recommendations, um, I approached uh, one of the generals as we were, we were, we were conducting, uh, a, a preparing for a strike, and we were looking at options other than destroying the target. You know, this was in, in a very populated, a very densely populated area. And how can we get at it other than actually destroying it? And the response was, well, Mark, I appreciate that you're providing us with other options, but how do I know they worked? Hmm. I know what a smoking hole looks like. And if I remove the building from the face of the earth, I know that it no longer exists and its function has ceased. I think that is, is, is a problem, is one quantification. And we need to show to them that there are ways to quantify and understand how civilian harm uh, occurs from their strikes uh, beyond just a smoking hole. Uh, these long-term effects and that it's more than just the people killed and injured in the actual strike itself. And once they realize and understand that they can quantify it and that it is knowable and foreseeable harm, uh, then they can take steps to minimize that harm. But secondly, and, and maybe almost more importantly, is in my investigative past, and I've, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years, I'm struck by how often I'm told, particularly by military personnel, but, but others in, in, as well, that people lie, that civilians lie, that victims and witnesses lie, and they are unreliable uh, in, in their statements. And I think this is just such an awful perspective. And we need to understand that our militaries, our governments have perpetrated this harm on these individuals and that their information is critical, it is truthful, and that people do not have a, a, a desire or a need to lie to a, a military or an investigator uh, and, 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 and it's really a, a quite shocking and, and upsetting thing to do when you're conducting investigations in the field, as I have with the United Nations, for example, 
and you speak to witnesses, victims, and, and those living in the area to try to better understand what has happened, and they tell you that, you know, uh, other folks won't listen to us uh, because they don't think that we're being truthful. And it's, it's really very unfortunate. And I think that's why the work that folks like Christian does is so important uh, because, well, militaries may say, hey, you know, civilians lie and, 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 and we can sit back and say, no, you know, that's actually not the case. When you have a third party like an Air Wars or a Bellingcat that provides some kind of quantifiable information that the military can look at, uh, then you, you can begin that discussion. And I think we need to really try to sometimes drag them forward and, and you know, realize what the harm is that, that's being caused. <sighs> I think I'd be remiss if I didn't provide Alma maybe an opportunity to respond to that, what you just heard um, from Mark as well. Uh, well, sounds familiar. I mean, uh, th that you are lying <laughs> as a victim, uh, it's, uh, it's an inaustasty, I, I think. I mean, uh, look at how we treat a woman who has been raped. She has to... to, to, to uh, prove that she actually has been raped. So we have to prove that we actually are genocide survivors. You have to prove that you actually uh, lived through uh, all of this. So that's really awful. And I was thinking, uh, uh, listening to you guys, and somehow it sounds like uh, when we talk about civilian harm, uh, we always have in mind uh, places where the conflicts are still going on. But it's even here in the Netherlands, I mean, take my example, uh, and how do you uh, treat those uh, survivors? And I'm not the only one. I mean, we have only uh, 60,000 Bosnians in the Netherlands, and we have uh, lots of Yazidi uh, people, uh, Uyghurs as well, uh, from Syria. We can learn so much from them. Just start talking with them and not calling them liars. And it goes really deep. Uh, for example, when, um, in our legal case, we had to prove that my father was working for UN peacekeepers, Dutch Bat. And we didn't have any paper, you know. Mm. And at some point, we did get, but we don't know from whom, from defense. Uh, some agreement that he was working, and then the lawyer changed their case, and mm -hmm. they said, okay, he was working, but... So even in court, you know, you were... We were called liars. So that's hurts like hell. Mm -hmm. Understandably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and, and not okay. also, if I may add to that, not, not also in court cases, but also, also people fleeing, mm -hmm. So asking for asylum in the Netherlands or other uh, uh, European countries, they are also not, not being uh, treated as th th in the way they should be. So first, like it, they think they should, they, it, uh, is the story correct? Aren't they lying? Instead of providing the services and, and the support that they, that they really need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, during the previous panel, but also extensively in the book, uh, we discuss the topic of responsibility for civilian harm. And Alma, you also provided us with a quote in advance of today's event, and it reads in part that in a conflict, there are only two sides, the oppressed and the oppressor, and neutrality means taking the side of the oppressor. That's quite a powerful statement. Um, so I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit what you mean by this idea of neutrality and whether that infers responsibility for harm committed by others as well. Well, that's the thing that I always um, get to hear from Dutch people here. Like, there are always two sides, you know, to each story. Yes, there are two sides. The one who tries to attack another one. In a conflict, there is always one party that thinks I'm bigger, I am meaner, I want to solve this, not through democratic way, you know, through talks and conversation, but I'm going to use force because I think I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm meaner, and I'm going to de destroy another one. And people who survive something like I did, they understand this, and they all say, yes, you are right. But Dutch people who never have been in such a situation, they always go, 
I don't know if you are right, there is always two sides. So I think, you know, uh, academia is great, but without experience, it's nothing and other way around. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Mark, maybe if you have a, a different sort of perspective to bring to this in the sense that you and your own words have, have also been on the side that has committed harm. Um, as part of your work for the U.S. military. So maybe in response um, to what you just heard from Alma, how important is it to not only think um, about your own actions and the repercussions therein, but also your responsibility for mitigating or preventing harm conducted uh, by others? Yeah, thanks. I, I greatly appreciate that question. I, I think that folks need to understand that military actors do try to minimize civilian harm um, there is not a desire to go out and, and, and kill people, at least in my, my experience uh, where I've done targeting. Although I have to sadly say, particularly when working for Human Rights Watch and the United Nations, I have seen states go out and, and wantonly and willfully kill civilians, such as the Syrian military in Syria. Um, you know, we have this concept in the UN of impartiality. And impartiality does not mean neutrality. It means that you're dealing with the parties to the conflict equally, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're condoning the actions of them. And in the way that we deal with civilian harm, I think we can be uh, somewhat impartial in trying to get information from a variety of sources, but it doesn't mean that you're not taking sides. It doesn't mean that you're not saying this is wrong. This is absolutely incorrect. And when we look at the way uh, militaries and the way that PACs, for example, uh, gets involved with various militaries, does training, works with them to try to better understand how they are harming civilians. Uh, I think there we can see that we can help them improve the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that they use, the way that they are conducting operations. Um, but in the end, it's civilians that are always on the receiving end. It's uh, people you know, with lives, dreams, et cetera. And, we, and, and you know, I think that's really the great thing that this book does is it brings forward cases that folks may not know about and stories that they may not have heard. And it explains to folks, you know, that you're not just taking out a building, you're taking out lives and an extension of a society and what's going to happen in that area. And when we with PACs go in and, and train militaries, we are raising this issue with them. And this book gives us yet another arrow in our quiver that we can pull out and show them, you know, this is what the results are of your actions and you need to improve what you're doing. Thank you so much, Mark. I think that's a great segue into sort of the last, I think, theme that I want to cover as we segue into our Q&A as well, which is talking about what, is, what are appropriate and necessary responses after incidents of civilian harm have occurred. So uh, maybe first to you, Yusuf, you've worked quite a bit on issues of accountability and these sorts of incidents. What are the components for, of accountability from the perspective of state? Um, and what are the ways that, uh, yeah, that accountability can be appropriately sort of demonstrated, particularly I would say, to victims? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a very good question. And I, I think the answer is going to be not so satisfactory because uh, the first thing that it's going to take a very long time usually for, um, for perpetrators to, to be brought to justice. Of course, there, is, there are various instruments um, like the uh, ICC you have. Um, uh, and, and then the, the response of states, of the Dutch state, is almost always in the first place that it's an, it, to the state itself to to, um, uh, to investigate and bring to justice uh, the, the perpetrators. And only if that's not possible, then uh, other ways come in. So then you can, uh, uh, for example, the ICC, but also um, the, uh, the Human Rights Council, they can uh, set up um, investigative committees or um, uh, well, expert panels that, that conduct research, stuff like that. Um, but that's all also always met. That, that, that's always met with a huge political, um, well, debate and uh, uh, coup handle. So they are, they are, they are, yeah. 
there are also uh, always countries that don't want to um, uh, to give in or they obstruct. So it's it's always a very difficult and lengthy process. I mean, there are some good examples um, uh, internationally, uh, but they are well, they aren't as widespread yet as they should be, and not as numerous as they should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe we can reflect on a specific example, too, from you, Alma, because you went to court to hold the Dutch state accountable um, after what happened in Srebrenica. So from your perspective, how should governments be responding in situations like this? And what would be important for you personally as a victim? And if I can do the really horrible thing of adding a second question to that. <laughs> we have a question similarly from a member of our audience for you, from Frederik de Vlaming, is, who's wondering, what do you think the function of court proceedings could be, an example, in cases like Hawija or Kora, and what are the, how can voices of victims be heard during legal proceedings generally? Oh, there is so, so many questions you know, in I it. I apologize. Um, during, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? <laughs> during of, after the war. I would say after. After. It was difficult, you know, because we, we couldn't go to UN to get our right uh, because of immunity. So we were forced to look other ways, uh, and this was the one, uh, one way. And then the Dutch government didn't want, of course, uh, to be blamed for it. And it took us 15, 16 years in total. Uh, um, and in 2013, the Supreme Court uh, ruled in our favor. And this was really um, difficult for us, for my mother, for my brother, for me, and my baby sister. She was only a few years old when we started, you know, and then she grew up and she, uh, she was in her 20s when we finished. Mm. Um, and it wasn't necessary. It could have been made easier for us by Dutch government just to have a conversation with us. Uh, so. I would say, please make it uh, possible for victims of war to get access to, to justice. And I shouldn't have be doing this, you know. Uh, it, it would be easier when you, you try to, to make some fun, I'm just thinking a lot right now, <laughs> for all of the uh, victims, you know, and to try to help them financially, non-financially, in uh, other ways, just uh, talk with them and ask them what do you need, um, and, and uh, take actions. Mm. Uh, but don't, don't make it such a hard way uh, to mm. get uh, right. I, th I think it also, it, 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 if I hear what victims are saying, that it, it's, it, it already helps when, they, uh, when a state acknowledges their actions and their possible wrongdoings. And in the case of Hawija, but I think Lauren knows better, that um, uh, we, are, we are going to uh, erect a kind of funds to do some kind of uh, rebuilding there. I really wonder if that's what the people there need right now. And why don't you... Um, do some more thorough investigation and ask what are your needs and see if you can, um, well, you can comply with that. But I think this is the problem, you know. We always think that we can figure out better what they need. Instead, just go there and ask them, what do you need? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pose another question to Christian um, from Tony Akayan. Your, the definition posed in the book of civilian harm really only focuses on harm caused by the use of force in hostilities. And, but NATO, for instance, includes harm caused by simply existing in the environment. So competing for resources, creating dependencies, damaging the environment, etc. For you, do you think that this the, this definition of civilian harm that we're proposing in the book um, and the, the type of research and investigation you do encompasses some of those more environmental um, ecological factors, um, and is that appropriate? I mean, we really like focus on, you know, we're, we're an investigations team, the visual investigations team that really focuses on specific incidents. So. Sure, there have been airstrikes, you know, and, and also in the pre uh, before, like with Bellingcat and Air Wars, like we're looking at each and every airstrike that we can find. Um, 
I think actually one that someone at Pax is, is, is more involved in looking at the environmental footprint than I am, uh, which is Wim Schweinenburg, uh, which is taking a close look at, at, at these kind of um, developments. And for us, it's really like, you know, it's, 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 it's sometimes hard because we're focusing on specific incidents to look at like bigger picture stuff. Like we're a small team and first figuring out who is bombing where, for example, is our, can already take up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I mean, like in Syria, you could definitely see the impact of airstrikes, uh, which which your colleague Vim focused on, uh, and I worked with him at the time uh, uh, when I was at Bellingcat. Um, you know, a lot of airstrikes from both the U.S.-led coalition, um, the Russian Air Force, um, striking makeshift oil refineries in eastern Syria. And you have to imagine, you know, what happened first is that um, both the U.S.-led coalition as well as the uh, uh, Russian Air Force were bombing um, actual oil refineries and oil, oil let's, let's call it oil, oil-related oil installations. And as they were bombed, you know, um, people started looking for other ways of refining the oil, which was obviously makeshift oil refineries, which were in the first place obviously leave a very strong environmental footprint, but it's also a very grave risk to health of people that are involved in, in the refining, but also the people that are living around it. And what you could see is that these, um, these uh, uh, you know, this is a direct effect of, of, of targeting of such facilities, which is problematic. And the interesting thing is, is that, you know, it seemed to me, to just give you one example and not talk too, too long, but like, Focusing on specific locations is so important, and I think communicating and having this knowledge available is important because there was one site where um, there was a lot of contamination of um, uh, 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 makeshift oil refineries, and um, after 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 a while, these these disappeared, but it was still there in the ground. You could see it on satellite imagery, but then a um, uh, IDP camp was constructed on top of it, which is obviously mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do. It's like on a former makeshift oil refinery, put an IDP camp where a lot of people will be in potential toxic waste. And you can just see there like, okay, if, if there would be more communication among um, defense departments, maybe uh, 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 international organizations that could possibly be avoided. Oh, thank you for that. Those uh, really concrete examples, appreciate that. One more question for you, Lauren. Um, this comes from Esther Ratner, who's joining us remotely. She asks, for those of us, quote unquote, ordinary people, meaning those who are not government, media, military, or academia, what can we do specifically to counteract these types of horrific incidents of civilian harm? Yeah, I think, I think you should um, realize that you, as a general public, have a lot of power. Um, so, as we were saying, governments go out of their way to not inform us about the civilian harm because they're actually quite um, um, sensitive to the opinion of the public. So I think as a democratic voter, um, look for parties that take these issues seriously and um, also seek alternatives to war. Again, going back to the idea, no wars are clean or perfect. So, you know, first question should be, is there no alternative? Um, um, and then, um, yeah, inform yourself. Um, find out who these organizations are, such as that we've, we've been discussing today. I mean, Amnesty has a fantastic um, report on um, uh, the battle for Raqqa, where 80% of the city was destroyed by coalition um, bombardments. And they have a wonderful site called um, uh, Rhetoric versus Reality, uh, where they bring the, the stories of the victims to life. And, and so it's about informing yourself. It's about informing others. It's about discussing, debating um, what kind of wars are, are waged in our name and what um, long-term effects those have, um, and being a democratic citizen. So um, your voice counts, and it does count in, in, in the realm of public opinion. So, right. yeah. Thank you for that. So a call to arms Can for I all of us. some words Please. to that? Absolutely. Um, you don't have even to go to those organizations, you know. Just look around. There are people around you, working with you, that you don't even know. Yeah that they have been there, you know, and that they suffer daily uh, from this. And uh, just share, sharing and talking about this uh, helps them. And maybe from there you can 
make great things. <laughs> it's so true, because one of the researchers um, did research on exactly this. So a lot of refugees in the Netherlands don't dare to speak out yeah. about their experiences because it goes in against the kind of dominant narrative that, you know, we are waging a good war, you're just here to be the perfect victim and, you know, you should be happy to be here, you know. So therefore, a lot of refugees don't dare to speak out um, in a day-to-day -day conversation or definitely not in a political realm. So I think that is a fantastic um, recommendation as a you know, great place to start, mm -hmm. to inform yourself. Absolutely. Thank you. So we're rapidly running out of time. Um, what I'd like to do is ask each of our panelists to, as much as possible, in just one sentence, maybe two, if you look really nice, um, what do you think is the main contribution that you want people to take away from this book and from the conversation that we're having here today? So I'll look maybe first to Christiane. Sorry, I wasn't muted. Um, you know, I think for me, I'm a Dutch citizen, um, and I think I really want to echo the, 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 what was, was discussed at the table before, but also brought forward by Mark is, you know, in a 21st century democracy, liberal democracy that the Netherlands is, you know, I think it is outrageous that we know so little about the wars that are being conducted by our military. And I think, if anything, I hope this book puts a spotlight on making people more aware and care, you know, um, to, to learn more about what our milita military is doing, because I think I, and I'm speaking here not as a journalist or as a a, 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 a Bellingcat member of Air Wars, but really just as a Dutch citizen, you know, it is it is up to us. We need we need to know it is being conducted in our in our name and we need more transparency. I think it's it's ridiculous that um, we have a lack of transparency in a country like the Netherlands when we're conducting um, uh, wars abroad. Thank you, Christian. If I can point Lauren another <laughs> contribution. Okay, I think you've just taken all the words mm. out of my mm. mouth, uh, Christian. Yeah. Um, what would I like to add to that? Br bring in the complexity. Understand that civilian harm doesn't just happen. End, at, like I said before, at, at the level of injury or, or um, income, a lack of income, but it it. it feeds into how we imagine this violence and can feed into new cycles of violence. And I think that is why we need to care for ourselves and others. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to have to close the session. Um, I hope, though, that we'll provide many other future opportunities to hear more from both the speakers that we have here, because I don't think the conversation is complete. Um, so there will be more, uh, hopefully, follow up after this event. So thank you first uh, to all of our distinguished speakers who are here, also for our panelists in the first session. Um, we're really grateful to your contributions to this event, but certainly to the field as a whole. Um, we're strengthened by your voices in it, so thank you. For those of you joining us who would like to read the book um, and learn more about Box's work on the protection of civilians, please do visit our website, protectionofcivilians.org. And again, this is where you can go to find uh, the book as a whole um, or individual chapters if you'd like to download them. Um, there are very limited hard copies available, so do feel free to reach out by email at poc at boxforpeace.nl for questions about inquiring. Um, please note we'll be asking potentially for a voluntary contribution to cover the cost of the hard copy and its distribution. And as well, if you have additional questions, suggestions, if you'd like to engage us in future discussions, uh, maybe at your own institutions or communities, please reach out by email. And if you'd like to hear more on similar themes, Box, in coordination with CIVIC, the Center for Civilians in Conflict, will be launching on the 29th of June with um, one of our panelists here actually today, Mark Garlasco, as one of the co-hosts, a podcast um, on the protection of civilians. So please check out our website, follow us on Twitter uh, if you would like to hear more, and please tune into that. Thanks, of course, to everybody who contributed to the monstrous effort over the last few years to produce this book. Um, certainly, kudos to Wilbert, Aaron, and Velmut for making it happen. But also thank you to everybody who helped make today's, hap today's event happen, including Bleienberg here in The Hague for hosting us, the AV team for ensuring a smooth uh, technical experience. Certainly, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for both making this book, but also so much of our work possible around the theme of protection of civilians. 
also the Dutch Ministry of Defense and uh, the Minister Bijleveld for accepting our invitation to receive the hard copy of the book. Anna Timmerman, uh, the director from Box, for joining us and sharing her comments today. And certainly all of my colleagues at Box and on the Protection of Civilians team, in particular Sandra, Anna, um, and also Anita, Selma, and in particular Ali, for all the work that went on behind the scenes to make today happen. And thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, we really appreciate your contributions to this discussion, and we can't wait to hear what you think about the book. So please keep in touch. Thank you so much, and until next time.